So thanks to, uh, again, we're only focusing on six of the many different cultures represented here in Southeast Wisconsin. Uh, thank you to all who have registered and taken time out of your very busy holiday season to be with us this evening and to learn more about the different cultures represented by our esteemed panelists. <clears throat> many of our guests may celebrate Christmas, mainly because of our European ancestors who came to this country. Our goal tonight is to bring an awareness of a few of the other 14 religious holidays that are going on between 20th November and 24th of January. So after tonight's session, you may feel more comfortable when someone says to you, happy holidays. I do this out of respect, especially when I do not know someone's cultural or religious background. Thank you to our panelists who have carved out time from their very busy schedules and lives to share and be with us tonight. I'm now honored to reduce, introduce our panelists. In our last invite that we sent out, we provided their more detailed bios. So tonight I will share a very abbreviated introduction of them. First off, uh, Janan Najib. Janan is founding member and president of the Milwaukee Muslim Women's Coalition. For 27 years, the coalition has worked to inform, advocate for justice, dispel stereotypes and build community in Wisconsin. Under her leadership, the MMWC opened the Islamic Resource Center, hosted the Milwaukee Muslim Film Festival at the Historic Oriental Theater, publishes the Wisconsin Muslim Journal, and runs our Peaceful Home, a culturally informed family strengthening and domestic abuse project. Janan is a Rotarian, is married to Dr. Walid Najib, and has five children. Thank you for joining us tonight, Janan. Next up is Rabbi Dina Feingold. Dina is a native Wisconsinite and graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has spent virtually her entire life in this area, with the exception of five years when she studied to become a rabbi at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in Jerusalem, and Cincinnati, Ohio. This is where she learned to love chanting the Torah and studying and teaching Jewish sacred texts. Her roots are in Janesville. Dina and her family joined Madison's Temple Beth El. There, along with her family, they became proud adherents of Reform Judaism. Thank you, Dina. Next up is Fahasa Heya um, Mabrahu Tu. Sorry. Masaya. Uh, Masaya was born and raised in Eritrea. He has resided in the United States since 1983. Married with three children, currently working as director of Black, Catholic, and Ethnic Ministries, which serves African American, American, Asian, and Native American Catholics here in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. Many of his previous positions I've left out, but some of them that I'm including are the chaplain for Wisconsin Department of Corrections, the Kettle Moraine Correctional Institute here in Plymouth, executive director for the Pan-African Community Association, which focuses on resettling and integrating refugees in the Milwaukee. Fasahaya is a Rotarian, he is also a founding member, inaugural president of the Eritrean Catholics of Disease Right in North America. Thank you, Fasahaya. Next up, Kate Jackson. <clears throat> Kate is a member of the United Nation and history faculty of the MATC, where she teaches Native American, Wisconsin Indian, state of Wisconsin, and early American history. Kate has been teaching at MATC for over a decade and starting her teaching career at UWM. Kate earned her bachelor's degree in American Indian studies with a focus on history, sociology, and earned her master's degree in public history and museum studies from the UWM and the Milwaukee Public Museum. Kate is a member of MATC's DEI committee, Wisconsin Indian Education Association, Wisconsin Archaeological Society, Bridge the Divide in Cedarburg, NAACP of Zaki County, and the Milwaukee FBI Community Roundtable. Thank you, Kate, for joining us tonight. Lung Shong is a project coordinator at home, the Hmong American Friendship Association. He is a Hmong community's advocate. He mentioned earlier that he's been in Wisconsin for 40 years, but he still hasn't gotten used to the cold weather. Long is honored, was honored the 2011 Hmong Man of the Year, president of the Xi 
he community incorporated he is the past president of the lao family community in saint paul minnesota active member of the Shi Yi community incorporated long is an interpreter a translator for the Hmong lao community and publisher of the english Hmong english dictionary which i'm sure not too many of you have a copy of thank you long for being with us tonight finally last but not least angie Rester. Angie is the CEO and principal of Rester and Associates. She is first generation of the United States. Her mother's from Panama and her father from Germany. To date, she has traveled to only 33 countries, has led teams for the YMCA and Rotary to Panama, Peru, Chile, Argentina, Japan, India, and Germany. Her career includes being the executive director of Tri-County Tri YMCA, Elmbrook Humane Society, Health Education Center, Hispanic Professionals of Greater Milwaukee, and Wellspring Education Center. She is the founder of several nonprofits, including Hispanic Professionals of Greater Milwaukee, the Rotary Club of Amigos, After Hours, and Pets Helping People. <clears throat> A Rotarian since 1985, past district governor, group study exchange team leader to Argentina, and our district's membership and DEI committee member. She's a driving force for tonight's session. Thank you, Angela, and thank you all of you for being here tonight. <clears throat> we'll start with our first question, and I'll go in the same order that I introduced you. Janan, thanks again for being with us tonight. So our first question to you, and you've got three minutes to elaborate on this, and I will um, Definitely let you know when there's about 30 seconds to go. So don't worry, you don't have to watch your, your watch or your clock. I'll keep track of it for you. Our first question to you is, <clears throat> our first question is, when do you celebrate your cultural year end and what is unique about it? Well, thank you, uh, Brian, and uh, thank you to everyone involved uh, uh, with uh, di diversity and uh, um, equity and inclusion here with uh, Rotary. Thank you for um, having me on this uh, distinguished panel, and um, I'm excited to, uh, to be here. Um, and uh, regarding uh, the question as far as when do we um, uh, celebrate our year end. Uh, one of the things that I think is uh, important to note is that um, Muslims follow the lunar calendar, which means that our holidays change um, every year. So they change by about 10 days. Uh, and so uh, whether it's our major holidays or the year end, it's going to change um, uh, by about 10 days. So this particular year, um, August 9th was actually our uh, new year. Uh, but uh, next year, the new year is going to be 10 days, uh, will be 10 days earlier. Um, so, so we have uh, our specific two specific holidays, which are, is um, uh, one of them is uh, um, Eid al Fitr, which is uh, that kind of culminates the end of our month of fasting, uh, Ramadan. And then we have uh, uh, two months and 10 days later is what we call Eid al-Adha, which is our um, major celebration. And that coincides with the pilgrimage uh, to Mecca. So um, just, um, you know, something to keep in mind that um, when you have to make your plans for the holidays, it is not the same, the same time every year. So it does change. And that, that requires that we have specific uh, calendars and it requires um, a lot of juggling to make sure that um, uh, we can arrange things, uh, whether it's school or business or, or work, uh, because it will change. Thanks, Janan. Janan, um, is there anything else that um, besides these the the lunar calendar that you mentioned that because uh, I know it's, uh, the, the Jewish calendar is also a lunar based calendar. Mm -hmm. And um, when you celebrate your, um, your year end, what is different about it compared to what we celebrate here in the States? 
Um, well, it's uh, it's considered a um, you know a more of a religious uh, uh, kind of year end, so so it's not something that is really a in particular a celebration. It's usually um, uh, noted with uh, um, uh, more worship, uh, and uh, uh, you find that there there's a recognition and um, um, a uh, um, acknowledgement of this being uh, another year and. So so uh, a reminder to people about, you know, how how short life really is and how a year has passed and people that were with us the year before are no longer with us. And so um, uh, whereas whereas it is it is, you know, something that is um, recognized, it's not a party type of thing. It's more of something to internalize and to remember in a more spiritual way. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to move over to uh, Dina. Dina, you've got the same question. If, if um, you'd like me to repeat it, I can. Otherwise, uh, no, it's please okay. share. Yeah. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. And I want to also thank you, Rotary folks, for inviting me to speak. I'll just add to my bio that I'm the daughter and the sister of Rotarians. My father, Leon Feingold, was the uh, very active member of the Janesville chapter of Rotary. And in fact, posthumously was named a Paul Harris fellow. And my brother, David is currently active in Janesville Rotary, although he's only there half the year now. So maybe he, he goes to Rotary in Tucson uh, while he's gone, or maybe he zooms in now to Janesville. I don't know how it works. Um, but uh, so I've known Rotary all my life. Um, Yes, our calendar is different as well, and our New Year season is at a completely different time of year. Our calendar is a lunar solar calendar. So we mark the months according to the cycles of the moon, but most of our holidays are seasonal. And so there's a correction in the calendar so that the holidays stay within about one month um, ev within every year. So our New Year is in the fall, it's called Rosh Hashanah, which means head of the year. And it's described in the Bible uh, as the new year. And it um, can be anywhere from early September when it was this year. It fell on the eve of Labor Day this year uh, up to the beginning of October. And um, it's a very complex calculation in our calendar that sets the year in the correct season. It's not all completely different than how the secular year gets a leap day every four years. Our calendar gets a leap month every two to three years. And so when it's not a leap year, the holidays keep going back about 10 days, as Janan described the Muslim holidays do. But then there's a correction of a whole month being added, and so they get they become later again, and then they start going backwards. So it's it can be very confusing, not only for non-Jews who just, it's like a mystery, like when is Rosh Hashanah? It could be any time during the <laughs> month, but also to Jews, it's very confusing. So we, you know, we all have calendars. We have Jewish calendars that help us know way ahead of time when these holidays fall. Um, and similar to what Janan said, our our New Year is is festive but serious. It's observed in the synagogue. It's religious. Uh, it doesn't have the frivolity that I would say the secular New Year has associated with it. Um, but it does have one thing in common, which is thinking about um, maybe areas where you've, uh, you'd like to improve from the previous year and be better in the year to come but not in the sense of New Year's resolutions like I'm going to lose weight or I'm going to go to the gym more or stop smoking or what have you, but it's more internalizing values and ethics and interpersonal relationships. And the theme of the season really is repentance, um, reflecting on past misdeeds, saying you're sorry for them, and promising to be better in the year to come. There is another holiday that's 10 days after Rosh Hashanah, which is called Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. And they, the two go hand in hand. So the new year, you begin that reflection process, and then you, spend the, you have that 10 days in between before Yom Kippur to act on your commitments and uh, go and 
talk, uh, have a conversation with people who you feel you need to maybe right some wrongs or misunderstandings, and then come back to the synagogue 10 days later for a 24-hour fast day. Yom Kippur is the day of atonement where we atone for sins, but we also, it's considered a, a full 24-hour fast, no food, no drink, um, where you really focus on the task of repentance and um, getting achieving one oneness with yourself and with God. Um, so as you can tell, that's a pretty pretty serious undertaking. Um, but there, there is some festiveness associated with it too. Uh, family meals, um, of course not on Yom Kippur, but when it's over um, and at uh, Rosh Hashanah, the new year. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, next up, Vasahaya. Um, <clears throat> I know with your introduction, uh, you've got, I believe, we really didn't say what you're going to be sharing with us tonight. I mean, you have a tremendous amount of background with uh, Catholic ministry, but I believe you're going to focus on something other than the Catholic uh, faith tonight. Thank you, Brian. Uh, yes, I, I have the best of tools, so I will be sharing a couple of things. Uh, it's good to okay. see uh, uh, a lot of you here that are familiar, uh, Janan, good to see you in a while. Uh, well, I'm from Eritrea, and Eritrea and Ethiopia share the same culture. So uh, then I will also touch uh, the Kwanzaa celebration. Uh, let me start from my uh, country of origin, Eritrea and Ethiopia is one of the old uh, uh, cultures uh, uh, related to uh, like what Janan and um, De uh, Dina, is it? Uh, Dana said, uh, our calendar is a solar calendar, but we calculate the holidays, uh, uh, the, uh, the lunar calendar, but we follow the ancient Egyptian way of uh, uh, calendar. And we do also have, they call it the Julian, but it is, we do have uh, 30 days each month, then we do have between the new year and the old year, we have five or six days of bridge. We call it the, the five days. If you see an old Ethiopian uh, poster says, uh, come to Ethiopia where there are 13 uh, uh, months of sunshine. Uh, so our new year is uh, September 11, on a regular day in September, I mean, a regular year in September 12th on a, a leap year. We have um, this tradition, to, it marks the end of the rain season and when uh, the grain starts ripening. So our New Year celebration uh, includes the Christian and the African traditions. The Christian tradition includes, has renamed or has made it like John the Baptist as uh, the new year. Uh, exactly we have, we call it, uh, then we call it Johannes Ahmed, which means the uh, is a, uh, head of the year. So we have a, a, almost the same naming. And then what we do is we celebrate uh, the new year by crossing over fire. I do practice in my backyard whenever we are. This is a way of crossing and burning the old things uh, and starting anew. And when back home we would have a, a, a light kind of a torch and we bless the, the house and saying old grain out and new grain in. And Two weeks later, on um, September 27, we have the Feast of the Holy Cross, which is also celebrated in a very similar way. But those are, as I said, though, uh, have been Christian uh, practice over them. They were both the grain um, harvest or fertility and the animal fertility uh, tradition that were uh, given a Christian meaning behind. 
our uh, Christian holidays, uh, uh, Christmas is uh, January the 7th with the rest of the Eastern Rite, uh, Christian traditions with the Orthodox, whether we are Catholic or not, we celebrate it together. Uh, of course, Easter is another holiday, also it's always very much closer into the ancient uh, way of uh, connected to the Passover, of course. Um, other celebrations are more uh, secular, uh, related to the national uh, thing. Okay. Well, from we, we can touch on some. Of, go ahead. We can touch on some of those in the next question. How's that? Yeah, yeah sure. But okay. uh, do you want me to go to Kwanzaa, or do you have time for? Oh, uh, that we'll go that. We'll do that in the next round of questions. Okay. okay. So I'm, I'm done. That. This is where we are in terms of how we celebrate is um, in this way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up. Uh, Kate. Would you like thank the question, you. Kate, or do you have it? Oh, no, I am good. Um, so thank you for the invite. Okay. This is fantastic. I'm learning a lot, which is great. So any opportunity to learn more is, is fantastic. Um, so I am a member of the Oneida Nation, and uh, I kind of want to preface that with saying you know, there's right now over 575 federally recognized tribes in the United States, and um, a lot of our holidays and traditions are vastly different from each other, um, especially when you start looking at uh, regional climates. A lot of our celebrations are tied to particular seasons. But in our case, we have uh, the more traditional New Year's, um, versus what we tend to do now with New Year's. Um, the more traditionally New Year's uh, follows a lunar calendar but is largely driven by the season. Um, traditionally, our New Year's falls five days after the new moon, and it can either be in, in January or sometimes February. Um, and it's a nine-day celebration. And it opens with an opening prayer, a main opening prayer, and then nine days later it closes with the closing prayer. Um, but each day has a specific purpose and a specific prayer to start and end each day. Um, the first day, uh, we have dances that are done during the opening prayer. Uh, this is done to acknowledge and honor uh, and show thanksgiving for all of creation. Um, the end of the day closing prayer is done to give you a constant reminder of the relationship that we have with all of creation um, and that we are merely one strand in the web of life. Uh, the second day is the stirring of ashes where in your own home and then visiting friends and family um, you would stir the ashes in their heart kind of turning them over um, and the ashes represented Mother Earth and by turning them over, you renewed her. Um, so being that it's winter, obviously, it's uh, when she's believed to be resting or renewing herself uh, for spring. So the turning of the ashes uh, is a representation of that. Um, on the third day, you would collect tobacco from everyone in the community. Um, and it's meant to show uh, acknowledgement of the community as a whole. Um, and thankfulness for uh, the renewal of creation and the ability to carry on our relationships and responsibilities. Um, songs are sung, and then the tobacco is burned um, in an honoring uh, to uh, dances that are done by the water drum. Oh, gosh. Uh, the fourth day uh, is Peach Stone Day. <laughs> it's a little more of a fun celebration. Uh, you, you, there's a game that's played with peach pits, and our clans play against each other, and we make bets um, for, you know, small things, food and little, you know, knickknacks and stuff that we make, and mostly breaking, right? Um, but that's meant to be a day to come together and have fun um, and uh, strengthen relationships we already have. Uh, the fifth day is set aside for uh, renewal and work uh, with the medicine societies within the community, the Fall Space Society, 
Um, we have uh, a great feather dance that is done. Um, so it's, it's largely um, coming together as a community. Now, nowadays, um, unfortunately, with, with colonization, um, our, our ability to practice those things was illegal until 1978. So unfortunately, a lot of it was lost. But today, um, Oneida and many other members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, we practice something called Hoyan. It's H-O-Y-A-N. And Hoyan means um, essentially another one. So it's another year. And what happens is uh, New Year's Day, you spend cleaning up the house, you know, out with the old, in with the new, uh, and making donuts. <laughs> the big thing is uh, New Year's Eve, yeah, you're making lots and lots of donuts because come New Year's Day is when everyone in the community travels to visit everyone else. So you would leave uh, one person at your home whose job it is to hand out the donuts. And it's almost kind of like trick-or-treating in a way where you visit family members, friends, community members, and um, give each other good wishes um, and feed them, which is a lot of the ways uh, natives show love. Uh, but the donut especially has a hole in the middle, so it's a circle. Um, and it's symbolic of, you know, the, the renewing of relationships, um, how they kind of are um, uh, this never-ending circle of reciprocity and whatnot. Um, a lot of times, you know, you can make it more entertaining. Some of the kids will make up special dances um, to do for donuts when they knock on someone's door so they can get extra. A lot of times the kids have competitions to see who can get the most donuts. Uh, but really, it's just about coming together as a community. Thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. for sharing. I appreciate that, Kate. <clears throat> um, next up, uh, Wong, if you could share with us. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for uh, the invite here again. Uh, uh, it's a very good way to really be uh, included in here and to learn a lot uh, from here. And I really do appreciate it. Um, and I think uh, just to, it's, I think it's important to uh, point out that uh, Christianity has just been introduced into uh, the Hmong, into Laos, uh, in the, the, the 50s by the French missionary. Uh, and so right now about around, we would, you know, it's hard to guess too, but around 50% or so of, of the Hmong uh, have been converted into some sort of a uh, denomination already. But the other about half, uh, the other, you know, 50% or so are still carrying on the traditional uh, belief, which is shamanism. And so before uh, Christianity, uh, before the 50s, uh, all Hmong uh, uh, were, were uh, uh, you know, practicing the sh shamanism. But shamanism to us uh, would just believe uh, and just worship uh, ancestors, uh, basically ancestors, grandparents, great-grandparents who die, uh, pass away already with the... Uh, uh, ask them to be good spirit uh, that guide us through life. That's all, basically. Or, and there's uh, the, some practice on that too. Uh, there's the shaman to to be in the the person in between um, the the living and uh, and the uh, and the, the spirit that we that the the ancestors. That's all. So now with that, uh, before the before the fifties. Uh, all the Hmong, the, the, the New Year uh, is celebrated uh, with, the new, with, with the lunar uh, calendar as well. And the lunar calendar was based on the, the fact that, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the last day actually we call Pekyo, it's 30. So 30, it's, we celebrate that last day, the 30th the day of the, the last the last day of the last month, which is the 12th month of the, the year. So wh whichever that uh, last day of the 12th month, which is the 30th, uh, fall onto, well, with the Hmong back in Laos, traditionally they uh, celebrate that day to be the, the last day, uh, taking all of the old thing out, the bad things out of the life, uh, bad things out of the family, and uh, celebrate doing an um, uh, offering to 
uh, the, particularly those who are uh, still practicing shamanism, then, then uh, that's the, the only time that they offer uh, the new crops or new crops, new, um, new, you know, new crop, new drink that they, they have prepared. They offer that to their ancestors, and so that they uh, they can uh, as spirit out there. Uh, they got something to eat. They can get uh, they they stay there to guide the, the the family through life and so forth. So, but uh, New Year. Uh, Back, you know, because the Hmong is a uh, one of the uh, major ethnic group in Laos only out of the, the, the close to about 50, about 55 or so different ethnic in Laos, but Hmong was the second largest uh, ethnic group in Laos. And sure, there are other national, other holiday within the Lao, within the Buddhist, uh, the, the Lao in Laos, they practice Buddhist, uh, Buddhism. So, but the Hmong, none of the Hmong are Buddhist. And um, the the you know the the Hmong did not the the fact that they are uh, that they practice shamanism they that day that's the only this is the only holiday that they uh, they they have the Hmong uh, the, the, no other holiday uh, this is the only that's holiday true. where that's an important one. yeah this is the only holiday that they had the chance to really celebrate, really offer to their ancestors or to really uh, have a chance to really, uh, you know, that the family have a chance to really celebrate life, basically. Uh, like like the, 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 the young, the boys and the girls, uh, they have a chance to really enjoy life and really have, have fun together. Uh, and also it's, it's a good time to really, you know, the, uh, the, this is the only time when they can toss ball. They can really uh, sing song together. They they choose their date even. And many end up married after that, after the new year. Oh, and so that's a big celebration. Yeah. So well, thank it's you so much for just, sharing that. Yeah. So it's not uh, so. it's not just religious related, but it's just you know, part of the cycle of the year that this is the only one that they really have time to enjoy themselves. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for sharing. <clears throat> Angie, I'd like to have you share. If you could give us an idea of how you're, what you're going to be sharing, because I know people are probably wondering about this. <laughs> well, first of all, I think, Brian, you'll remember that long ago when I was starting the Amigos Club, I shared with you that one Latino doesn't mean it's the same as another Latino. It's much like we've talked about the other countries and other areas. Um, Nothing is a constant. No one is the same. Village to village can be different um, depending on uh, how um, native they still are versus um, Christianized. Um, obviously, most Latin American countries uh, had missionaries, and those missionaries superimposed Christian values onto their beliefs, and um, many who had shaman. Uh, they took those beliefs and tried to change them into the Christian model. So what happens when you go to Latin America? I've been able to actually be in Chile and in Panama for New Year's. And um, they again, they all don't do the same thing, but there are some, some things that are kind of common. One is if you have ever, uh, the other Latinos on the, the uh, webinar here um, know that Latinos do things late at night <laughs> and they eat their meal for New Year's late and they try to be with family. Family is very important to, to cheer in the new year with champagne usually or some, a drink that they prefer. And um, I know in Chile it was Pisco Sours. Um, and they then either stay and party with their family and have a good evening and they they go into the early morning um, or they go out and um, and the next day can be either like just going to the beach and spending the day at the beach or going uh, to see parades in different villages where they're burning effigies usually of political figures or people who have been in the news and they burn these stuffed big effigies um, called muñecos uh, to 
kind of get rid of that old life and going into the new. And I've been to those. And boy, oh boy, um, there were political figures from the United States being burned <laughs> in those parades. Um, the, my best New Year's of my entire life was one in, in Panama. And um, I went to see family. My mom's from Panama. And I was told to take a nap at 6 o'clock. And then at 8 o'clock, we got up and we had a wonderful dinner with the first time I'd ever had the dulce platanos. Um, but they were so good. The banana-like, they're sweet and baked. And then um, we, and we had like um, arroz con uh, guandules, which I think is very Puerto Rican as well. Um, and then uh, we toasted at, at midnight. And then my cousin, who was 20, um, said to me, Angie, we're, my, two of my friends are meeting up with us and we're going to go for, to a celebration. And she didn't want them to know I was 29. She told me I was to tell them I was 21. And we got in this little VW and I was in the middle where they do the stick shift. Um, and we went an hour to the beach on the Pacific side. And I get, we get there and we park and we go to these tables, plastic tables, plastic chairs. They bring us a, an olea, an old olea tub of uh, ice cubes, a bottle of Panamanian rum, and a bottle of Coca-Cola. And I was like, wow, there's nobody here. This was like at one in the morning. Nobody there. I thought, oh, okay. And within half an hour, the place was packed. And the music started, and we danced salsa, cumbia, all kinds of dances all night. Then we went to a disco at 4 in the morning. We left there at 6. We went to a restaurant. We had breakfast. We danced on tables. And then we went and picked up our swimsuits and went to the beach. And then later we came back and went to the parade to see the effigies burn. And that night went to bed. It was the best New Year's of my entire life. It'll never be replicated. But... That's very Sounds similar like. to other Latino countries that they it's really a welcoming of the new year. Thank very you, Angie. I appreciate that. <clears throat> well, thank you, panelists, for answering those uh, the first question. Um, we're going to go into the second question, but instead of three minutes each to keep us on time, I'm going to go to two minutes each. So uh, bear with me if you could. Um, we want to try to get the third question in before um, we open this up to questions and answers from the audience. So going back to Janan, um, <clears> the <throat> second question is, how different or similar is the Western year? And you may have answered part of this already. And what might be surprising to someone outside? So if we could, if we could hold it to two, two minutes, Janan, I would appreciate it. Sure, um, and I, I do think that the, um, it's, there's some similarity to the first question. Um, the idea that it is, while there is some sense of celebration, it is really more spiritual and more reflective and uh, uh, more an idea of, um, you know, what you're going to do with your life this, uh, this next year in terms of, you know, um, uh, something that uh, will benefit uh, um, humanity, what you're going to do in terms of, uh, um, you know, your worship and your connection uh, with God. And um, so that's, that's definitely something that is different. Um, the fact that I had mentioned before also that, um, you know, our calendar uh, follows, it, it's a lunar calendar. So it means that our two major holidays at some t point um, also fall at the end of the year. So um, I want to just mention something about the two major holidays. I had mentioned uh, Ramadan. Uh, many of you may be familiar with that. It's a month of fasting for Muslims. Um, it's uh, one month in which we fast from um, uh, basically from uh, dawn until uh, uh, sunset. And, um, you know, it might during the winter hours, of course, that's going to be uh, shorter days during the summer. It's very, very long days. And um, the purpose of it, we believe, is really to build that uh, um, uh, character and uh, um, the idea that um, 
that fa fasting builds God consciousness because it reminds you that um, you're dependent on God for many of the blessings uh, um, in your life and, and what you um, what you do have. And it's also uh, supposed to be a reminder to us of those that don't have what we have. So it, it's a, an opportunity to try and um, uh, um, and make things right uh, in society. The second major holiday we have is uh, coincides uh, um, with uh, the pilgrimage to Mecca. And so for Muslims, um, Mecca, in Mecca we have, there's a, a structure called the Kaaba, and uh, it's a black cubicle structure. Many of you might have seen it, but it's what it represents. It represents the first house built on earth for the worship of one God. We believe it was built by Prophet Abraham and by his son Ishmael. And so Muslims, whenever they turn um, to uh, to pray anywhere they are in the world, they, they will turn to face the Kaaba in Mecca uh, to symbolically show that they worship the God of um, Abraham. Uh, and so um, these are, you know, th these are the two kind of uh, uh, major holidays. And because, again, of the change in the, in the lunar calendar at different points in, in one's life, they will fall at the end of the year as well. So. Thank you, Janan, for sharing that with us. <clears throat> uh, next uh, person up would be our, would be Deanna, Dina. Dina, if you could share yeah. with us, that I would be great. I, I think I already also answered this, that the holiday, our New Year, is much more reflective and religious and observed in the synagogue compared to the secular New Year. Um, and one of the things I didn't mention is that the chief symbol of the New Year is the shofar or the ram's horn, which is blown in the synagogue, uh, and it's a commandment to hear the sound of the shofar. It's literally the horn of a ram. Um, and it's supposed to be a wake-up call to uh, help, uh, you know, make us wake up to what kind of person we've been in the past year and think about how we can improve ourselves. Um, not so much physically or, you know, uh, in terms of sort of uh, aesthetic things, but how we can be, uh, improve ourselves internally and be better people in the coming year. As I was listening to um, other speakers, it occurred to me that uh, many of our traditions have something about going to the water. Um, and we have that too. On our new year, we go to the nearest body of fresh water and take little stones or breadcrumbs and throw them into the water as symbolic of getting rid of our sins. And this can be done by yourself or with your family, but in many communities like ours, we do it as a, a community. We have our worship services, and then we are located just blocks from Lake Michigan, so we all walk down to Lake Michigan together and perform this ritual together. And it's, it's very... Um, I think that for many people, it's one of the highlights of the of the new year. Thanks, Dina. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Let's say, uh, would you like to touch on um, the uh, Kwanzaa? I know you didn't have a really chance to do that with the first question. Uh, Kwanzaa, uh, which is a Swahili word, is a, an African American uh, celebration. Uh, but uh, Kwanzaa, I mean, it's first fruits, is taken from the African uh, culture uh, celebrations of harvest season, uh, which I mentioned uh, earlier in the Eritrean uh, tradition, in the Ethiopian tradition, is the beginning of the ripening of the crop. So that has a, a correlation between how a Kwanzaa was created or developed to uh, bridge the culture void that African Americans have been deprived for centuries because deliberately they were stripped of their culture, language, and ethnicity. So it was in the 1960s, 1970s, during the Black Power Movement that Dr. Ron Karinga uh, uh, went to Africa and did um, uh, make a research in his, uh, he learned Arabic and, uh, and Swahili and uh, compare the different culture uh, celebrations of harvest season and did this Kwanzaa celebration. Uh, this is a celebration probably all of us may have uh, 
an interpretation how we celebrate, but this is intentionally created celebration, uh, which is not, did not grow up, uh, did not develop or, or organically like the other ancient traditions. This is more recent, but also has a purpose. So this is a, a, a celebration that has been created for a purpose and to recover the lost cultures and traditions in the black community. Uh, and it has seven principles. Uh, the seven principles are uh, unity, emoja, kijangulia, self-determination, ijama, collective works, ujama, co cooperative economics, nia, purpose, Kumba creativity and Imani faith. And each uh, is celebrated from uh, the 26th of December to January 1st. It was deliberately put in this holiday season so that the African American community is not deprived because the uh, Christians celebrate or the, the Western celebrate Christmas and the Jewish community celebrates Hanukkah in that same period. So this one was done deliberately, but it was with the intention of recovering the lost values and uh, traditions that were uh, deliberately taken away from the African-Americans. Uh, so Thank you so much. This is, the, this is the youngest celebration of values and culture. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that information. <clears throat> we'll move on to Kate for your response. Kate. Um, how, how are our celebrations different to Western? Very, very different. Um, <laughs> uh, you hear a lot about you know, individual resolutions, um, individual renewal and such. Um, for us, because traditionally, uh, until Christianity is introduced, there's no original sin. There's, there's nothing we have to atone for. Um, and everything that we do in life is not for some desired outcome when we pass but everything we do is so that the people and creation to come after us have a good life. So when we look, especially at the traditional new years, um, while we do have opening and closing prayers for the whole nine day event that, you know, go to the creator. Um, it's not a, a, a worshiping of the creator. It's more of an acknowledgement of we, we are part of creation and without creation, we cannot exist. Um, one of the things that's often talked about, uh, the fancy term for it's the, the principle of equal entitlement. That's kind of what Western society is titled it as, but it's the idea that um, all things born and unborn um, have natural rights and equal rights to the benefits of the earth, you know, and that humans are not on any sort of hierarchy in creation that we rely on the rest of creation in order to survive. Um, everything we eat, our housing, our clothing, our tools, supplies, everything comes from taking from creation. Um, if, if humans were to disappear off the planet, uh, life would go on. You know, undoubtedly climate change would stop and things probably would get better. Um, but it's, it's very much so an acknowledging of the renewal of creation and the fact that we are grateful that we are a part of it um, and that what we do is for our community and for creation and not necessarily the, the me, myself, and I, but it's, it's the community um, largely as a whole. And that, that can be quite different from some of the dominant religions. Thank you, Kate. Appreciate that information <clears throat> for sharing with us. Okay, we're going to move from Kate and we're going to go uh, back to Lung to talk about the Hmong. 
All right. Thanks for you know, allowing me to be back here again on the question number two. Uh, definitely, uh, yes. there are two, um, even the Christian Hmong or non-Christian Hmong, uh, during this New Year celebration, everybody uh, sort of uh, have that new, that sense of a new um new being uh, of uh, of uh, uh, the the new year to even though these are more uh, christian monk now but still having that uh, traditional uh, belief that you know that the monk are the, the monk um the, the monk um, that the christian the christian is still new within the monk community uh, Christianity is still the new within the, the newly introduced into the Hmong community. So uh, we still believe that you know no matter what, this is the time to really uh, to to really uh, th because this is the only one time in in back over there in the only one time to really uh, have time to celebrate life, and so. You will see new clothing, new everything is new. Everything has to be the, the old thing, the bad things, the, all of that has to be gone by that 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 the thirtieth day uh, has to be washed out, has to be clean, has to be all of that. Even parents uh, even uh, uh, told the children that yeah, you know, tonight it's a night to really have to take a bath. And then you know to really <laughs> clean everything up, so so everything has to be new to the, to be ready for the first of the year, uh, and so forth. So it really, everybody is looking forward to that. It's not just tradition, but it's just uh, in the spirit as a whole uh, as well. Um, and again, um, the 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 part that it's the non the non Christian monk definitely they celebrate. They 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 do other you know more traditional way to 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 uh, to celebrate that which is different than other um, than other um, uh, the probably culture too because of the the the, the, the belief and the monk the, that traditional belief would be that you know uh, that we believe in the reincarnation too and so that whatever we do to 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 help. Uh, to uh, the, the the whoever is going to be reincarnated back, the the ancestor who will be reincarnated back into the family will have a better life too. So uh, that, that that's how the, the preparation is for like that. Thank you so much for sharing. I appreciate that. <clears throat> We're going to go on to uh, Angie's next up. Um and. Again, because of Christianity, the missionaries in most Latin American countries, very westernized, uh, if you want to, as far as how they celebrate today. However, I, um, as part of another time that I was in Panama, I got to go and be with actually relatives who are the Gobe Bugle Indians. I'm actually just a teeny tad shy of 10% Native American. Uh, Central American, and I've been also to Peru uh, with the Quechuan people, who are the former Incan, um, and they're still very spiritual and connected to the earth. They really see uh, the celebration, which most likely they do, not most, they do more at the harvest time, kind of like Tessahaya was talking about, the African culture, that harvest time is just that's the beginning of a new year many times for them. But because of Westernization, they celebrate, but they truly, it's called high, uh, the energy of everything. It's not just people, it's the land, it's the, the animals. And they, they honor them. They see them as necessary for existence. And, and the effigies, the burning of the effigies, Actually, some of that started way back when they would burn effigies of the Spanish conquistadors to try and they're ridding themselves of that past to be able to move forward. Um, sometimes they even will burn an effigy of themselves to indicate that they're going to have a significant life change moving forward. But some of the quick things that some, not all, but many Latin, Latino, uh, Latin American countries in Spain do are they, they sweep, they clean the house, to get up rid of the old. 
um, they will eat 12 grapes at midnight. And each stroke of the 12 uh, clock is for good luck, 12 months in the new year, 12 good wishes. Sometimes they, they, there's a, cult, um, um, a tradition of what underwear are you wearing. Um, yellow is for good luck, red is for love, and black, you're going to have bad luck. Don't wear black underwear. Um, you know, stashing cash. But I really quick want to touch on the other thing is that people get very frustrated in Latin American countries because they feel like nothing happens between Christmas and January 6th, the Epiphany, Three Kings Day. Big time celebration when they believe that three kings arrived and discovered, uh, found baby Jesus. And my mother has always told me that Three Kings Day was when you got presents and celebrated, and the presents you got were whatever you didn't get at Christmas time. Uh, so it was a religious celebration, but it was also a time of gift giving and making up for what you didn't get at Christmas. And they eat like, kind of you guys might know, King's Cake in New Orleans very similar. They'll have that kind of a cake and they share it with family and friends. But they love to party. They love to have fun. <laughs> That's good. Thank you for sharing. So going back to starting off with Janan again, if you could just with one sentence, Janan, what is the main challenge related to your cultural celebration here in the Western world? Well, obviously, as a, a minority and a, um, a, a faith that is uh, um, not, you know, uh, as well recognized, uh, you don't really see it represented. And um, uh, you have difficulty if your kids are in school, you know, they might have exams on the days that you have your holidays or you have your, your cultures. Uh, same thing with, uh, with work. Um, so, so there's that lack of representation. And so even raising kids here, um, you have have to intentionally try to make the holiday um, be uh, present for them. Thank you. That is a challenge, I'm sure. <clears throat> Dina, what is your major challenge at this time of year? Well, I'd say it's very similar to the challenge of the Muslim community that um, it's not well recognized that there are Jewish holidays that come in the fall, usually when, when the, those holidays are happening. It's the very beginning of the school year, and uh, we expect our families, our children, our adults to uh, give up whatever they do for that day, whether it's work or school, to be in the synagogue and be with their families and celebrating. And that can be very challenging because, especially in the schools, the the uh, the teachers and the administration don't usually, if they're in public school, they have no understanding that this is a special day, and oftentimes. Uh, big events or uh, in Wisconsin that day when they count all the kids and perfect attendance is wanted uh, can fall on our holiday. And it, it's, it's a real challenge to balance your, your secular life and your very important holy days. Thank you. That is a challenge. <clears throat> uh, Professor Haya, if you could just give us, uh, if you want to focus either on the Kwanzaa or the Eritrean, well, I, I can, I, I can, wait a minute. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. I can uh, put them together in one sentence. Number one, the uh, Janan, and then I said that our celebration is not recognized, so we have to do it in our home. But the Kwanzaa issue is where, is a new celebration, though it has been almost more than 40 years, still there is, misconception it is seen as an artificial feast uh, celebration so a lot it has not uh, it has has improved over the years but has not really taken roots uh, as we would like to have it certain communities to celebrate but also there is sometimes uh, you kill uh, the messenger uh, for delivering the message uh, Ron Karinga the founder or the, the, the developer of this program was a member of the Black Power Movement. So some of our, our politicians target him as if this one was an, an anti-American or other things. So these are also challenges that the African-American uh, community uh, face instead of 
embracing it and instead of using it as a recognition of what has been deprived for the last 400 years, some politicians politicize it as if this is an anti-America, as an artificial thing. So we need to work hard on this one. Thank you. Thank you. It's very unfortunate. <clears throat> Kate, if you could share with us. Yeah, wow. Okay. It's, um, it's, it, it's one of those things where it's, it's difficult to go from the only population here to the absolute smallest um, and to literally face up into the 20th century arrest for practicing any of these things. Um, Hollywood has done us a great disservice. Um, U.S. history textbooks have done us a great disservice. Uh, the boarding schools, uh, where we lost a lot of our traditions. And I guess one of the biggest issues is our ceremonies and our way of life has happened here for tens of thousands of years. Um, and when you look at uh, the arrival of the colonizers, it's you know, basically a snap of the finger in time. Uh, so it, it's, it's definitely hard when oftentimes we're forgotten about, um, but a lot of us keep in mind, you know, that the land, the land hasn't forgotten, you know, it knows we're here. And if we even have to do these things quietly on our own, because it's not accepted, um, that's just how it has to be done. Thank you, Kate. Wow. <clears throat> Uh, Lung, if you could share with us in one sentence the biggest challenge. Thank you. I think the uh, just like many other speakers too, that uh, the challenge, uh, the main challenge uh, to the Hmong community uh, celebrating the new year is that when uh, the, the last day of the last month of the 12 month fall, not on the weekend, not on a day where uh, everybody's off, then we just have to push on to, you know, push off until a day where, uh, where, uh, where family can celebrate together because of uh, uh, some other obligation in work and school and all of that, just like everybody else. So you will see a lot of Hmong in many different community celebrate New Year, different time of uh, different, uh, you know, like that. And so, uh, but again, that's that's the main challenge that we we do accept now that, well, you know, when, when, whenever you can just celebrate as some even call pre New Year celebration, even because uh, it's not on the right time in the right day. So that's a challenge. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. <clears throat> Angie, if you could wrap it up. You're the last one to answer this question well, for us. As far as the Latinos in the United States and Western culture, again, very uh, westernized. Uh, even you know, grocery stores carry the masa and the plantains and the, a lot of the food that people use to uh, symbolize the new year. Um, I would say that a, a, a challenge is that um, there are people who are still attached and, and have a great deal of indigenous um, ancestry. And as I have found in my travel in, in Panama, there are six very strong indigenous groups in Panama who have their own identity. One of them even has their own um, uh, they are considered a separate province within Panama and they're able to elect officials to be at the, the government seats, which is not the norm at all. <laughs> but they are really trying to be able to bring back some of their, their culture into celebrations. And much like everybody else has said, it's very difficult to do. I know that as I looked at communities and have worked in communities in Southeastern Wisconsin, and Mary Beth, you're on the phone call, but um, or on the meeting, I found in West Bend, I am shocked by how many people don't realize what a large Latino population is in West Bend. And the same in Waukesha and other communities. I know that happens with the, the Hmong community. People don't even know they're there because they have learned how to kind of stay within themselves. 
and not be, they're not comfortable. Um, I worked with Casa Guadalupe and they were not comfortable even going to the farmer's market. So it's, we have to find a way as a, a Western, uh, Western culture to be more welcoming um, and, and, and really seek to understand the people who are on this call, this meeting tonight, you're seeking to understand more. We've all learned a lot. How do you tell your neighbor? How do you tell other people in Rotary? How do you tell people at work? Because that's, this is not where it needs to end. It, this is just a, an hors d'oeuvre and we need to go further. Sorry, on my soapbox. <laughs> that's okay, Angie. That's okay. No, seriously, when you think about um, with uh, Rotary, we're in 200 different countries and territories. We seem to forget about that when we're in our own little area and we forget about all the different Again, we just scratched the surface with a with a with six different panelists. How many different cultures are represented in Southeast Wisconsin? And we just we um, we don't recognize that and take time to appreciate what they bring and what they contribute to everything that we are made up of the unity. But um, I thank you again uh, for joining us this evening and taking the time. And uh, again, we'll. We'll stick around for anyone that would like to ask another question or two. Thank you.